delight that um, you can all come and join us today um, to hear a little bit more about some of the work that's been happening at Marble Hill. As many of you will know, Marble Hill is being revived and we are looking forward to our house being open for free for five days a week. Um, it will see the landscape being improved and, and today uh, we've been doing some landscape training with some of our um, amazing volunteers to share about the things that are happening and for them to be able to share on site um, with everybody as part of our community outreach. We're really looking forward to um, our, our landscape being biosecure and that investment really ensuring that the space is, uh, is um, as beautiful as it possibly can be for our, our community, but also for um, our animals and mammals that um, call Marble Hill their home too. We're investing in our sports facilities so that um, our community have, can have really good drainage on their football pitches and a better changing space that is, uh, is which is good for uh, men and women, which is very important. And Henrietta, I'm sure, would have been proud of that. We're also having a lovely uh, cafe that's being improved and it will be open in the spring, um, so not very long at all. Thank you all for being here today and being part of the events part of our activity plan and we are really delighted to have worked with Thomas Cromwell and his amazing team as part of Historic England. Right, um, well thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm an archaeologist working for Historic England. Uh, my contact email is down the bottom of the screen there in case anyone wants it. Um, and I've been involved with the Marble Hill project for several years now um, from before the the Heritage Lottery Fund application right through to now. Um, and um, for those of you who aren't familiar necessarily with Marble Hill, and there may be a few of you out there, um, this is the site as viewed from above, the sort of brownish grass on a particularly hot summer day by the looks of it. Uh, and it's one of many houses that were built along the Thames here in the 18th century um, when the Hanoverian court moved to Hampton Court because the, the river obviously acts as a, a nice highway. So the house is in the middle here. Uh, the formal gardens mainly stretch around the house and down toward the river. Uh, and it has to do with the way in which the land parcels were purchased, but we can't go into that today. Uh, and we've been looking at several features uh, in November, one of which was the ice house seat that I talked about last month and I believe is online somewhere. Tonight's one is the Nine Pin Alley. And then we also looked in these woodlands at the arbors and a uh, covered walkway feature, so a uh, sort of pergola structure that uh, we'll talk about in a minute. And then later this summer, hopefully, we're going to come and excavate the grotto back to its original size. And sometime in the autumn, presumably, we'll have another one of these the lectures based on that. Okay, now Henrietta Howard, had been purchasing land here from the 1720s. The house starts in 1724 and is completed in 1729. The landscape presumably at about the same sort of time and then evolving over the years. So we, we've got 300 years worth of history to play with here. And the interesting thing to do with the house design is that we've got this plan dated variously um, to 1748 through to 1752, depending on whose arguments you, you follow in terms of the, the evolution of it. But at the moment is widely believed to be dated to 1749. And it's, we think, to do with a land transaction issue that's going on. And it's a, essentially a plan of the estate as it stands. And it's drawn by the surveyor to the Duke of Argyle, who was one of the trustees for Henrietta Howard. And the important things for us are in the in the center bottom part, you can see the detail of the formal gardens from the house down to the river. And in the top left, there's a key that tells us what those features are. And if we look in detail at it, uh, we've got the house at the top middle there, uh, lettered A. We've got the, the formal gardens stretching south. At the top, top left, we have the ice house that we talked about last month. The top right, we have an orangery. And then the bottom left down here, we have a feature that we now we know is a, a nine pin alley, conveniently because the key tells us 
that it's a nine pin alley. So there's, there's no interpretation issues to go on there. Um, and if we look at it in detail, I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry, but it's the, the quality of the scan that we've got. Uh, I can't zoom in on it. And under the current circumstances, I can't get a fresh scan, obviously, because um, I'm not going to be able to get to it. But we've got a rectangular feature. It looks like it's bounded by some sort of hedge. And it's got a square in the middle, which if you can, if you get a clearer copy of it, shows nine dots arranged in a pattern. Um, so three rows of three. Above that, it's got what looks, looks suspiciously like a bench drawn as an oblique view, which is a, a normal characteristic of these sorts of plans. And at the bottom, there's another rectangle that presumably is a matching bench facing this central square. Up in the top corner, we have what looks like a gap for an entrance. And then sort of the, the middle left-hand part of, of the area has what, what appears to be two rows of trees, which seems an odd thing to put in any sort of playing pitch. Um, it would certainly make tennis more entertaining. So um, we, we know that that's what the plan in 1749 shows us is meant to be there, but we don't know necessarily sort of what sorts of activities are, are being talked about. Um, there are two strands essentially to uh, bowls and nine pins. Uh, essentially, one form of game which evolves into lawn bowls, in this case is a medieval manuscript showing what's called feather bowls, because there's a, a feather in the middle that they're aiming at, uh, which only requires basically a set of bowls and some sort of object to throw them at. And we know that there was a bowling green plant, well basically that the lawn in front of the house was laid out to, to function as a bowling green, because in the initial plans for the site, um, the one that was drawn up by Alexander Pope, who's a good friend of Henrietta Howard, he actually tells us there's meant to be a bowling green in front of the house so that it catches the daylight. And it's described in graphic detail in, um, in letters from Pope, uh, which are ex explained in David Jakes's fine book on um, country gardens. Now, um, we know there's a bowling green and we know there's a nine pins alley, which is a separate structure. And that also has ancient roots. Um, there's a 16th century print of people playing nine pins. And you can see there's some sort of wooden palisade around it, some sort of boundary. And it may well be set into the ground. And it's being played by fairly aristocratic looking people uh, in a, a nice formal garden setting. Um, however, it was played by other people as well. Uh, this is one of the frost fairs from the late 17th century. And you can see uh, they're ordinary Londoners playing bowls. Uh, it consists of nothing more than the pins and the ball. Uh, so you don't need much in the way of infrastructure for it. And of course, that meant it could be played at pretty much any social level. Uh, this particular painting shows a, a classic scene that's obviously a pub garden with someone bowling uh, with no more infrastructure than the ball, the pins, and of course, a bench on which people can sit and drink whilst watching. Um, which of course is crucial. And we have the same happening here in England. Um, there's a, a, an illustration from 1740, which shows the same sort of thing of a pub garden with people playing Skittles. Um, interestingly, underneath the Skittles, you can just about make out, they sit on some sort of board or platform set into the ground. Um, so this is obviously now has more infrastructure than previous games that we've seen. Um, and you could take this sort of thing indoors if the, the weather was terrible and if you happen to have a convenient long gallery in your house, uh, which of course ruled out most of society. Um, I'm not so sure what the teenager on the left lurking by the fireplace with the crossbow is thinking about, but we don't want to find that out. Um, but it's a flexible sort of thing. And as you can see, it's, it's not necessarily the sort of thing that's going to leave us a huge amount of physical infrastructure. Um, however, things do change. Uh, this is an 18th century print, and you can see they're playing in what's obviously a recessed or sunken alley uh, with some sort of boards forming an edge around it. The people appear to be, well, the middling sort. The sign on the right that says what looks like cider choice implies that it's a pub garden as opposed to uh, a stately home garden. Um, 
And there are some interesting features. We have this odd plank on the ground, which uh, we run into again later on. Uh, but in this case, the pins aren't sitting on any sort of square board. Okay, but if we look at this um, set of instructions, a, a pamphlet printed in 1786, um, it says rules and instructions for playing at Skittles by a society of gentlemen. And you can see it's got a, an illustration of how the game is played at the top, a layout plan, and a set of rules below that. And this layout plan, you can see we've got a recess and again, um, a set of boards around it. And in addition to that, yeah, the, the, the people playing it all seem to be a reasonably aristocratic class of gentlemen. There's uh, a servant on the right bringing more bottles of wine and a bowl of punch by the looks of it. We have the board, we have the square that the pins sit on, and another small board. And the rules explain how all of these are used and how you score and what counts as a foul and so on and so forth. So it's a game that's becoming more formalized with infrastructure. So the question is, what are we actually looking at at Marble Hill? Now, this is the, uh, the drawing that shows the, the layout of the site. And the, the crucial thing that we'll run into a bit later is this is 12 foot across um, in terms of size. So we know that there were problems with nine pins and skittles generally and with bowling as well, lawn bowls, uh, generally in the hands of the ordinary folk. As early as 1366, we have Edward III uh, coming up with rules to ban the playing of bowls because his soldiers are spending too much time doing that and not practicing their archery as they're supposed to. Um, and the yeomanry generally. Um, Edward IV complains about the same thing and sets rules against all sorts of pub games. And Henry VIII does similar. And coming all the way forward to the 1750s, there's an act against uh, the playing of Skittles and the ripping up of Skittles alleys. And there's all sorts of regulations as to who can have them and how much you have to pay for the privilege and so on. Uh, the interesting thing with this drawing is it suggests that the square that they're levering up with great effort is probably a slab of stone rather than some sort of wooden board that would obviously rot away in the ground. Um, so we have the two different types of bowling, but we also have a problem because the, the Skittles, as we see in the, the more developed form, don't seem to fit this space. Um, we're not seeing in this illustration any sunken play area or any wooden boarding uh, or anything, in fact, that would leave us any archaeological evidence. But there are other forms. Um, this is uh, an illustration from Germany about the same sort of time period that we're looking at the 18th century. You can see in the middle the square that the pins are sitting on and people with balls waiting to, to throw them at them. And you can see people sitting either side of it and entertaining themselves. Um, there's facilities that are more to do with the comfort of the spectators than the actual playing of the game. But it is still a formal structure. And the, it has a surprising parallel to the layout of our site. So if I go back to that, um, if we imagined that um, scene taking place from the top to bottom where the two benches are with the background looking down our avenue of trees, it would fit quite nicely. So if we put our site onto the Ordnance Survey map, because um, the main axis of Marble Hill is not north-south, but slightly northwest to southeast, and we overlay the contour lines, you can see that the contour lines spread out a bit over the court itself, indicating a relatively flat space in an area that otherwise is sloping in several different directions. It's a gentle slope, but a slope nonetheless, which isn't terribly good for any game where you're rolling a ball along the ground. Um, we had a, an obstacle with all of this research. These red circles represent root protection zones for the nearest trees. And you can see that they cover the western half of the feature that we were hoping to look for. Um, so in 2017, we laid out a T-shaped trench, which is this, this blue T, um, with the idea that it would catch at least some of the edges of this feature if they, if they existed. And when we did, we found to our surprise, uh, a large linear, almost sort of oval feature 
with edges that were a bit a bit wobbly in terms of shape. They, um, I think they've they've suffered a bit over the years. And you know, and what may have been a more linear feature has spread a bit. But it produced pottery of roughly the right date for the house. And we had a few gravel pads that we we were wondering whether they represented something to do with where you park statuary or or planting of some sort. And in the middle of this, um, there's what looked to be an intrusion, a later intrusion, but still probably 18th century. We, we weren't sure whether this was a patch repair, um, whether it was something to do with a tree throw from a, a later tree that had, had damaged the site, but it was clearly a separate something. So we wanted to come back, but when we did, we found that this rectangular area was now planted with new trees when we came back in November, um, meaning that we couldn't expand too much further to the east. It's a bit, a bit unfortunate, but not a huge problem. So we designed a trench, this purple trench, that basically fit the space that we were allowed to play in, with the idea that it would turn our T-shape into a larger square area to try and trace these features and see what's going on. In particular, are those gravel sort of rectangles um, anything regular in, in terms of a pattern around our larger feature? And what does this have to do with what we see in the in the plan? And when we when we sort of cleared it up, we found the extension of the larger yellow feature, um, again, sort of you know, full of um, lumps of, of London clay, which clearly isn't sort of from this site. There aren't any real outcroppings of the clay here. Uh, you'd have to go probably further downstream into London to find them. So we've got a feature that's deliberately excavated and deliberately filled with something that's deliberately brought to site. So it's obviously a man-made structure of some sort. And we couldn't think of any sort of horticultural reason why you would put this horrible clay in a trench because you couldn't do anything useful on top of it. Um, we also found the end of our smaller intrusive feature, but more interestingly, we found a feature whose edge was very well defined, extending out the other end, that I, I suspect is probably a continuation of our intrusive feature, and thus a second phase of whatever activity is happening on this site. Um, and the interesting part is the distance across the widest bit of the red feature is about 12 feet, which seems to fit well with the, the general dimensions of our rules of, of laying out nine, uh, nine pin alleys in the 1780s. Of course, this is about 30 years earlier, and I suspect we may have um, multiple phases of activity happening in this area. Now, this is the trench that we opened. You can see how shallow the topsoil is here, uh, which means that we're, it's very susceptible to any form of trampling uh, machinery driving over it, et cetera, basically smudging and, and mangling the archaeology underneath. Now, this is the east end where we had that extension to the, the features that we found in 2017. You can see the, the thin wadge of clay that has only been half sectioned in the photograph um, just there. Um, you can see the edge that we conveniently marked out so that it appeared in the photos. And you can see that Overall, the entire feature was only maybe a spade's depth below current ground surface. Um, it was deliberately dug, but not very deeply so. And the area around it, in fact, most of the trench turned out to have patches of gravel pressed into it. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but this is the other end, the west end of the trench. Unfortunately, because of the tree root protection zone, we, we daren't go any further across to the west. So we didn't find the other end of this feature, but it does have a nice sharp edge to it. So again, we're looking at a man-made structure uh, full of, of these lumps of clay that are brought in. Um, now, oh, okay. We do have finds from it. There's um, various sorts of pottery. Um, most of the datable evidence from the features works out fairly well for the 18th century. We have clay pipe, which still needs to be looked at um, by our various external clay pipe experts, usually very, very well datable to 
within a decade or two, um, sometimes even to the manufacturer if you're lucky. And with a pipe bulb, we might get lucky on that. Uh, we have coinage, and this speaks to really the, the, the post sort of nine pin use of the area, because from 1902 onwards, the site becomes a public park and our nine pin alley disappeared uh, probably sometime in the 19th century when an Italianate garden is installed along the middle terrace from where the nine pin alley is now to where the grotto is. Um, and it's right on the edge of where the trees are to provide some shade on a hot summer day whilst the kitties run around on the open lawn. And we've got from right to left uh, a coin from Victoria, a coin from George V, and one from Elizabeth II, showing that for the last hundred years or so at least, people have been losing pocket change right on that edge, which would be perfect for picnicking. Um, so it's a, a distinct change of use of the site. And we know that the gaming tradition carries on because uh, this little ceramic cube is a jack, about the size of a normal die um, that you'd play you know, gambling with. Um, and you, you get a bunch of these in a ball and you see how many you could pick up as the ball bounced. And it's covered in a lovely rich green glaze, which I'm sure for the 19th century is probably full of things like arsenic and lead and all sorts of other lovely things you want your kid to chew on. Um, but it does show a continuity of entertainment happening in this area, although it's no longer elite entertainment, it's the general public. Um, so I think while I'm looking at in terms of the evolution of the site, and this is still a work in progress, I still need to, to think these through. I think we start out originally probably with a raised gravel area with a square for pins and seating north and south and trees down the middle of it, which may well have been in pots. They may have been the orange trees that come out of the orangery in the spring uh, to get some fresh air and are put away again come the autumn. And they're just laid out in this convenient space um, as opposed to something that's actually planted because you know that would have left some sort of evidence of planting pits. Um, and if it was a raised gravel surface, it wouldn't have left a huge amount of significant below ground features. And then I think the area is cut into to form an alley. So a depression is cut, boards are put in, it's backfilled, etc. cetera. Um, and it may even have been revamped in line with the, the 1786 rules at some point into some a slightly narrower feature. I'm not sure on that. It's a bit uh, something I need to think about some more. And then of course, I think in the 19th century, the whole lot is swept away because they want to lay it to turf when they put in the Italian garden um, and they effectively remove it in the same way that the grotto disappears at the other side, only to resurface in the 20th century. Um, and in doing so, they remove pretty much everything except the very bottom traces of the layer of, of gravel that made up the, the original surface, um, the bits that get trampled underfoot basically into the top of the brick earth. Hence, we don't see much of that structure because it's all been swept away. Um, at least that's my interpretation of it. Um, and obviously, I'll take questions on this, and then we'll be continuing next month talking about the arbors.